Montgomery County Fire Workforce Tele Staff calling. Enter your PIN and press the pound key. Hey, good afternoon and welcome to today's episode of Challenges in the Streets. Uh, talking about the scheduling officer and the office and uh, telestaff. I'm Battalion Chief Mark Davis. Uh, happy to be here again. We're live from the command lab here at the PSTA. Would like to note our new set, working on uh, some set design behind us. Uh, many thanks to the folks who worked hard to make that happen. You'll see some changes as we move forward, uh, trying to enhance the backdrop that you see. Uh, today, I do want to note as a special 90-minute episode, we felt that the topic was going to be pretty popular. It allows people to ask some questions, uh, and we didn't want to say it was 60 minutes and end up going 70. So uh, we've allocated 90 for the topic. Just uh, mark that down and keep that in your mind as we go forward. Uh, a couple things, as always, if you're a certified chief officer wishing to receive uh, CUPDI credit, make sure that you sign in now on the YouTube chat with your fire service ID and your name, and then do again at the end. If you're watching from a firehouse with a group of people, uh, please identify what firehouse and how many people that will be helpful for us in keeping track of uh, the number of folks that are watching. As always, we try to uh, talk about some kind of current event or recent event. Uh, a couple weeks ago, there was a fire in the Calverton area of Prince George's County just across the line from Montgomery. A bunch of our units went, and the reason I wanted to talk about it is, uh, so it was a house fire, and I ended up using a temporary water main. So think how many times in Montgomery we see a WSSC or Rockville City uh, temporary water main out there. We rarely ever use them, and on this event, uh, the folks did have to use that. So Chief Ryman was kind enough to provide some photos. So let's take a look at the first photo. Pop that up. Uh, so this was shortly after arrival uh, in the Calverton area. So right, house is on fire. It's not a big house, but there's clearly a fire in the house. Go with the second one. Uh, so you can see on the right-hand side of the road, you got four-inch temporary water main. So the important part to remember here is that most of the time that is going to be four inch so there's going to be some limited uh, water supply capability there in most cases most of the time it's not a big problem we rarely run these but today they did or that day they did so that's 15's wagon they laid out a four inch line from a hydrant which go to the next one and that was the hydrant fitting, right? So it's important to get out in your first due area when we do have these temporary water uh, mains in place and take a look at how they're set up, what kind of valving that they have, what kind of cover they have on them. So that's 15's Humat valve. Notice that it is charged uh, and supplying. 41's wagon did eventually pull up and they did connect up to that and supply water to 15, but that was uh, 15's Humat on that temporary. Uh, it could be a number of different configurations out there. Always think it's important to go and take a look at those when they're out there. Make sure you got the wrench to fit onto some of those things. Uh, again, most of the time we don't use them. We talked to Chief Dempsey about what kind of flow might you expect out of there. Uh, pretty reasonable to expect uh, a 500 gallon amount of flow on most of those systems. Maybe a little bit more, maybe less, depending upon where you're at. On that particular house fire, a uh, couple attack lines, but again, you think about fighting a house fire, you don't open the line at the front door and then say, hey, let's go find the fire, right? So it's a open up, shut down, move in thing. So the total flow at any time did not exceed that water main capacity. Anyway, uh, we want to get to today, and today is dedicated to uh, scheduling and telestaff. I will tell you, there may be a few of us left, right? I can remember being the captain at Station 1, and they faxed the next shift's schedule over, right? So you got the schedule for next shift on a fax that came over, and that's how that all worked. And eventually, we have moved to where we are today with uh, all kinds of web-based stuff, mobile-based stuff, right? You can get it on your phone. You can call in sick from somewhere else in the world, whatever, uh, using the technology exists. So we have folks here today to talk uh, about that. Captain Brady Miller, I'm going to turn it over to him. He's going to be the moderator to get us started. So, Captain Miller. Chief, thank you. Uh, I don't even know if the fax machine works in my firehouse, if you want to know the truth. Uh, first of all, I'd like to just introduce everybody. At the end of the table, we have uh, Chief Mullendor. She is currently the uh, staffing battalion chief. And next to her is Master Firefighter Ruth, the scheduler on the A-shift. 
And uh, Captain Paul Groves, who is the captain at 19 on the sea shift. Uh, I think what we're going to do really is start with you, Michelle, if we could. Um, walk us through your day, or what does your day look like? Okay, well, so most people, just like in the scheduling office, we get there early, somewhere between 5, 30, 6 o'clock. Uh, as, like um, Chief Davis had said, back in the olden days, we used to have two schedulers in the morning. Um, we have gotten away with that with modern technology. We've gotten a little more efficient. Um, we, so there is no overlap at all? There, the only time there's overlap is when the when it's really busy on bad days. If we have, like, we unfortunately, we've had some of the force holds or, like, we have snowstorms, weather, uh, things where we have an um, unusual amount of people taking off that it, it's just a lot of work to try and do in the couple hours. There's a scheduler in the office starting at 5 a.m. Um, the one that's off going is back up and in the office at, at, by 5 a.m. at the latest, uh, addressing any you know emails of sick leave or whatever that needs to be taken care of for that day. And they begin to start on uh, building, you know, finishing that roster for the day to see what changes have occurred. And then um, I come in in the morning, usually hopefully between 5.30, around there, and I'll assist him with whatever needs to be done. Uh, if he's doing – if the scheduler's doing okay, then I will start looking at things that need to be done for the next shift. Um, so we're building out, and I'm going to say today, for example, we're, we're already building out Friday's schedule. Correct. Okay. So uh, I probably was able to um, – uh, Master Firefighter Mor Morabito was able to get it done efficiently this morning and was done by the time I got there. And I was able to start on Friday's schedule about 6 a.m. One of the reasons we need to start so early is because of the emails and phone calls that come into the office with people either coming home, going home sick um, or injured or just moving personnel around. Uh, we get uh, emails from different officers as far as, um, as everybody knows, for like training purposes um, that uh, – to mitigate what we have to do as far as what we how we have to adjust the schedule so we look at the the shift calendar the um the apparatus calendar tracker and uh, the doc log to see what things need to occur as far as how we're going to build the schedule so that's how, many how our emails do you answer in a day <sighs> too many to count it averages 40 to 60 a day 40 to 60 a day and, and they have to respond to each one and would phone calls the same um, sometimes yes, and honestly, some people have called to cancel their leave or something that is not does not necessitate a phone call. Um, an email will suffice, and uh, uh, the only phone calls we should be getting is something of like that is urgent and matter. Somebody's gotten injured, going home sick, um, or you know, a chief needs to call and needs has questions about the roster or needs a further explanation that we can't. An email wouldn't be a good enough for. Okay. Um, the, uh, because our day gets busy with the phone calls and the emails and, um, adjustments that we have to make throughout the day, a lot of times it's best for us. Our busiest times are like the first thing in the morning, trying to build the roster and get it done before all that, basically before everybody wakes up, right? After everybody's done their lineup and they start send, uh, notifying us of, of information. Um, and then, uh, we go throughout the day, we have to do, um, other administrative stuff. We, uh, have to verify the transfers. We have to um, check to CSBs to make sure that they're, you know, they can be approved. Uh, we go through. We also look at the next couple days roster. So, like today is Tuesday. So I'll also look at Wednesday and Thursday's roster to see if certain things, as far as um, uh, chiefs or safety or EMS, you know, have to be filled right away if we don't have sufficient personnel. Um, we don't necessarily look at. I have not looked at tomorrow's roster until later in the afternoon once I've accomplished the other tasks that I need to take care of. We do start to get some emails early in the morning from officers or whoever they're looking out for their people, and I appreciate that, They, um, you know, about moving their personnel back for tomorrow. A lot of times we don't get to that till like, the afternoon. And I, I kind of say as the dust settles, right, people canceling leave or taking sick leave or we have to put people off or on or, or again, for, um, you know, if they have training and we have to adjust people for training. How much chaos does that add when I call you in the morning and say, hey, move firefighter. Firefighter X took sick leave. Move firefighter Y back into well, the, the firehouse. The difficult part is that um, is once people – there's a lot of people, as you know, as being in the firehouse, a lot of your employees get there before 6 a.m. They've relieved somebody. Yeah. 
And so if you call me at 6.30 and say, hey, I need one of my firefighters back, well, they've probably already released somebody at another firehouse. We are human. We do make mistakes, and Sir. sometimes we miss people. We do the best that we can. Um, one of the, the hardest things is that when people call out sick, sick at, like, 5.55, and it's like, all right, now we got to figure out it's not so much as one easy move to move that person back sometimes. It depends on what – uh, what what they're doing that, you know, what position are they fulfilling? Are they a driver, a medic? Are they a specialty teams person? It might not be so easy to move that person person back. Um, we tell officers when I talk to them to notify us as early as possible so we can try and make If that somebody move. is sick or if you want somebody back? If they or... want somebody back. If okay. they want somebody back. Of course, if somebody's sick as well because it, if it can affect some people um, – you know, I try and ask people to look outside just their station as far as how it affects other things when they want people to be moved back. Um, the, uh, sometimes for them it's simple, right? They're moving a firefighter to a firefighter yeah. position, but they may not realize that that firefighter is like the backup driver for somebody else. So uh, we have to look at it, and sometimes we put you on hold, and we're like, let us look at it, and we'll get back to you. Or if I come in to relieve uh, Captain Gross, and I'm like, all right, you know, uh, Cap Miller's on the phone and asked to move so and so back. Are we able to do this? And he might already know the answer, or, or he say, "All right, let's look at this and we, you know, talk about it." So the earlier we know stuff, absolutely the better, as with anything. But if you have people that come in and relieve um, people early, and then you're calling me at 6:30 and saying, "Hey, so and so, his alarm didn't go off, or he's sick and he, it didn't, whatever," um, we can't always get that pe- that person back, unfortunately. It's a whole lot of parts to the puzzle. There's Pieces definitely a the lot puzzle. of lot, lots of different parts. So, so, in, so you're not only scheduling for a shift. Correct. You're all three shifts are scheduling for all three shifts. They're approving CSBs, all of that for all three shifts. Yes. Okay. Yes. And it's, I guess I I have seen a lot of consistency, I, really in the last couple of years, when it comes to that. So, okay, so we're through the morning. Keep so, going. Well, and so uh, once the emails and phone calls start coming in, sometimes we don't, uh, we don't get the schedule built, you know, quickly and efficiently because either the morning was – Today's like, or next shifts? Next, we don't okay. get next shifts done. So we've, you know, gotten through like today, okay, good, and inevitably I'm working on next shifts, and at 7.30 I have somebody, – somebody needs to go home already. And in the morning at 7 a.m., honestly, sometimes it's easy to get a replacement for them, right? Because some people have signed up for overtime. They haven't left their firehouses. They're, you know, sleeping in, and they're able to get hired. Once people have left the stations and gone home, you know, especially we have a lot, you know, a lot of our employees don't always live in Montgomery County. I'm just not even talking about another state. I'm just talking inside the county. They've gone on to do other things. So if somebody goes home sick, it may take us several phone calls to find a replacement. It's not going to be, hey, I can find somebody in five minutes and they'll be there in 15. It might be an hour or two before we get there, or it might be 20 phone calls that we have to, um, especially in the evenings. You know, people have had dinner or they're, you know, ready for bed and they're, or they're two hours away and they're not going to come down for the overtime. They're already home. Uh, so it, it makes it more complicated once people start going home, uh, if we have to replace people. Um, also think about that. If we have, if today was a bad day and we're going to have the rainstorm come, right, and they decide to activate the water team or they activate the TRT team, those totally throw us into like a whole nother tailspin. Because bringing people back? We have to bring people back. We have to put people off the floor. You know, uh, if we have an activation of some sort, you know, I, we get notifications depending on sometimes uh, we don't only get notification like an hour or two before that, by the way, they want the people off the floor now. So I have to deal with today's people of who, who is on the list to take off. And then uh, I have to backfill them. And what am I backfilling them with? You know, some of the TRT people are FEMA t- people, but we still need to keep TRT people at, like, Station 31, for example. So it depends on what we're backfilling with. Um, if it's a boat, a boat activation because of the water, then I don't need to put more boat people back in the station. I just need, like, an engine driver or a medic or whatever that's backfilling that boat person. So, so there's a lot of variables that literally are constantly changing. Just like the weather it keeps on changing. Okay. So it, uh, yeah, so, and it, it progresses that there's times where um, because I'm down the hall from the dock or I'm a phone call away from the chiefs that, you know, they need stuff done right now. 
So sometimes I don't get a lot of my, sometimes I don't get some of my stuff done until the afternoon. And then maybe I get lunch at two o'clock. So uh, the, um, we can, if everything is a good day and everything's running smoothly, I can start hiring people for next shift starting at 1030. So it's important that if people are signing up for overtime and want to get hired, they need to do it before 1030. So you don't, okay, so the whole after dinner, 7 o'clock hour, it seems to me like when the phone starts ringing at station 2. Uh, um, that's, that's, for the, that's for the next day. Yeah. She's okay. talking about the next shift. Next shift. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, yeah, for hiring. So for hiring for Friday, I, ha I could start hiring people starting at 1030. So um, if I hire people, uh, sometimes I've gotten phone calls, hey, I didn't sign up. I'm like, well, it's been negotiated that you have to sign up before 1030 or sign up before I start the hiring process. So the earliest I can do it is 1030 in the morning. So I can finish the basic roster for Friday, um, you know, at like eight o'clock in the morning, but I'm not going to hire anybody for those positions until after 1030. Okay. And then tomorrow is the, in the evening. Yeah. For the most part, unless it's uh, like FEI or safety or battalion chiefs, um, ECC, people like that, they, you know, to try and fill whatever vacancies are left from, for whatever reason, um, you know, so that we can do that. Uh, usually if the day runs smoothly and I can even touch tomorrow's roster, I will start looking at trying to move people back to their stations. Um, I won't do a whole lot of hiring. Uh, I, one of my terms is I call the dust settling because you have people that are taking leave, you know, canceling leave and then leave spot open. So somebody else gets leave and it's a whole lot of adjusting around. Now, some people will, um, so like I'm on a shift and we're working today. Some people have canceled leave for tomorrow and they're left unassigned when they're normally in a, an assigned position. And so if they canceled their leave yesterday, they might have emailed Mike yesterday and said, hey, how come I'm not back in my position? The problem is, again, with the dust settling, with people taking leave and uh, canceling leave, that there's a lot of pieces moving all the time. So we uh, wait until the, like the afternoon or evening before, before we start adjusting the next day schedule. So for B shift tomorrow, if they canceled leave on C shift, let's say yesterday, then we'll leave them unassigned. And then I'll look at it tonight or this afternoon, this evening, and see if I can start putting people back in their stations, moving people back. There's, I get emails from captains, I'm still unassigned and they're normally assigned to a station. It's like, well, we might've hired overtime in your position at the moment. And I, I don't wanna, fire riff that person then have to hire him again and then maybe rift him again and hire him again in, in the couple of days until the next shift so we leave one assigned chief if i may ask you how many people how many positions do we staff day, day so, how many people is she dealing with every day so she deals with 305 people 305 every day. people career staffing it's on a shift but she's looking at being so you're looking at a thousand people 915 people right yeah. Pretty much. And none of it, how much of it is auto-generated? Any? So it's not auto-generated. Basically, people are in a, for the most part, we put people in assigned positions. So if you look at your station. I'm in a position. You're in a position, and most of your positions are filled. Some of the stations I have left, like on A-shift, I leave a couple vacancies because I have to move pieces around, just like we talk about. It's like a puzzle. So if I have training days or we have, um, in our case, we have one of your firefighters that's trying to do truck training mm -hmm. at another station. So I have to leave a, a position at, at that station vacant, and if there's nobody from that station working that day, then I'll take your firefighter and put him in that position. If I have people assigned to every position, then I have no place to move people to. Um, if you're in an assignment, you have to be moved to another position. You can't just automatically be put, be put unassigned. So it's not auto-generated. Basically, we make the assignments. If you, as, a, as the officer at Station 2, send, tell me to put, you know, Firefighter Smith as your engine driver, then that's what I'm going to put in that assignment at the moment. I may leave your, leave your A2 position vacant so that I can move other people around. Okay. Depending on training. So you know all of those things, and then all of the nuances, like Brady calling Michelle saying, hey, I, I want to accomplish these tasks. Yes. And we wow. do have some, um, we do have, when we have people in training that have moved from like one station to another, some of the, um, the recruits, right, the new rookies that have to go do ambulance time at another firehouse, and you're swapping with somebody else 
that, oh, this person's not going to do truck training, you know, you're swapping personnel. We have an online whiteboard that we have access to that we can access from any of our computers when we log on. Um, yeah, I went in the office the other day. I didn't see any whiteboard. There's no whiteboard. So, uh, yeah, so uh, Battalion Chief Kaufman had created that for us when he was in the position so that we could access it from any station. So a pass it on book, if you will. Exactly. Scheduling pass it on. But, and it has on there that, you know, Captain Miller wants this person moved to this station, you know, if there's a vacancy for truck training. For these dates, who authorized it? And so if he is working on my, on my shift and he's like, hey, why isn't so-and-so back at their station? Or like the the rookie um, the rookie firefighters, you know, you can go look on that whiteboard and see that that person's supposed to be doing their EMT skills, or driver training, their medic, whatever stuff that they need to do. Okay, so we this pulls us into the evening time, I guess, with okay. you, and and tell us continue. So we've gone through the go through the day. We got the next shift done. We've done CSBs. We've answered emails and phone calls all day. We've got finally got a shower. We finally got something to eat. And um, I've tried to at least touch tomorrow's schedule. Dinner comes around, okay? Now, some firehouses, you have dinner, whatever time it may be. You all know that I'm at Station 32, so I'm at the mercy of the guys at 32. Uh, and, how, how, and how bad they get hit sometimes. So dinner may be at 5.30. It may be at 7 o'clock. Um, uh, my day still continues from 7 o'clock in the evening on, whether I've eaten dinner or not, is basically when... Um, 7 p.m. or 1900 is the last time that you can cancel day side leave for, for the, the following for the, for the day. next day and so uh, that's kind of when the dust is sort of settling right so people can't cancel day side leave anymore they can still cancel their night side leave but mostly it's day side leave and I get those last bit of emails just like um, anything else so then I really dive into looking at the schedule for tomorrow sometimes I might have a game plan ahead of time um, <coughs> And then, of course, as soon as I get that game plan, the players change, right? So, uh, so, uh, but I do as much as I can as far as I've already tried to move some people back if I've had time. Um, and now it's like, do I have extra people? Where am I going to put them? Do I need to move people to get them placed? Because there are no, you know, uh, fire two spot to put them in. So uh, that can be simple and that can be difficult. There's days I've come in and uh, I might not have anybody on a sign and I just got to worry about moving people back and start hiring. And there's days where there might be 20 people unassigned, and do I even have the vacancies to put the 20 people? Or do I have to move? And who do I move? What do I need? So it takes a lot of time. There's uh, times where um, I'm still trying to hire overtime at 9 o'clock at night because it's been, and by the way, that's if there's no phone calls or emails during that time while I'm trying to do that. That's when I like to call you and chat about stuff. Absolutely <laughs> you do. How's the weather? Yeah. And, yep, yeah. absolutely. Because I'm not doing anything. Exactly. So. <laughs> You guys get your dinner, you've had your dinner, you get cleaned up, and oh, by the way, I forgot to cancel my leave for next shift, or, you know, I needed this, or I also, a lot of the chiefs are out and about, um, and they're catching up on the emails that the captains have sent them or anything else, so that comes in usually about like 9 o'clock in the evening. So, uh, and now I've gotten an email, as we all know, with COVID and everything, we uh, were getting bombarded with the AML, AML people, and it's, it's stepped up a little bit. So we get a lot of those emails throughout the day of having to move, you know, place people on administrative leave for the COVID. So, um, you know, and it's like, okay, well, now you just took out my truck driver or you took out my medic tanker driver, depending on what it is. So who can I fulfill those positions? And if there's nobody signed up to work that overtime, now who do I move? And then do I move somebody back into their station? So it's not always as simple of moving one person to another position. I may have somebody, de a junior guy, detailed out because there's no place for him at a station. Well, now I took one of your drivers and um, to go fill that tanker position. Well, now I can move the junior guy back. Well, if I move the junior guy back, does that mean somebody else comes back in the battalion? So it's um, one one position. We have to re like reevaluate like each time. Numerous things. Yes. What are we? Um, what do you? I understand you. There's some CSB constraints. Mm -hmm. What other types of things? I mean, obviously the apparatus tracker, training. Is that what? what when you say CSB constraints, what do you like, mean? Is, uh, the, like the bargaining agreement. Like, what are your guidelines? And are those guidelines? Are you, are you, are you speaking to approve a CSB? 
Any the, of the, the CBA. I, I apologize. CBA, yeah. not CSB. CBA. Oh, oh, oh okay. So okay, what, okay. what okay. guides okay. you in your job? Both, either one of you. I don't. The, we follow the union contract. I mean, that's okay. That's all okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, that's. He's absolutely correct. And the, the thing about it, though, is what people don't. One thing that people don't understand when they compare, like, oh, well, this scheduler on A shift did it different to B shift and C shift, is that. Also, the players on the different on the different shifts, um, are, well, the players on each shift are different. It's not always that we have like on my shift. I have I have lots of medic officers. I don't like using them as the medics, but unfortunately, I have a bunch of fire twos. They can't do a whole lot, so unfortunately, I have to use the medics as officers. Whereas you go to another shift, and they might not have as many medic officers, or they don't have as many boat operators, or things to that nature. Okay, Chief, you had a couple of questions. Yeah, so um... we have three. Uh, one, I think you kind of answered. It's, uh, let's go back. Somebody asked about uh, how many transactions you think occur in a day, right? Meaning hundreds. Time that you touched telescope. So, don't have to be exact. One point in just... training, we were training someone, and there was one move, and it was from the time he built the schedule to the time it was finalized there was over 80 moves on that schedule in order to 80 different finalize. touches you're touching yep. 80 different and you're moving things. people here or there yeah so, so can, can, I, can i give an example of of one yeah one with an action of one person how many actions it takes to fix it so let's say somebody takes sick leave at 5 30 in the morning all right so and let's use station four for example so when that person takes sick leave from station four, we then have to look to see if there's anybody detailed out of station four to bring back to station four. Is that always our first look? Yes. Let's bring people back. So we will have to look to see who is detailed out. Well, let's say the junior guy is at 25. We now have to move the guy from 25 to four to his home station, which leaves a vacancy at 25. So then we have to look to see. So nobody's detailed out from 25 because there's a guy detailed under 25. Then we have to go look to see if there's somebody detailed out of battalion. And let's say there's a guy from 35 detailed out of battalion from 18. So he's got to come back to the battalion. And then that leaves a spot at 35. So, so you can see how one person calls it. I mean, that's, I mean and then you have to find uh, who's going to work at that spot at 35. You and know? that's not including drivers or specialty teams? Or that's just a body. That's, a, that's just a body. So, you know, let, let, let's say that spot's overtime. So we would draw on that for 24 hours, 10 hours, and 14 hours. So let's say the guy that we're hiring overtime at 35 now, and let's say the 24-hour guy comes up is, uh, I'm just going to use the name, Kale Latchall. We draw on a day side, it's Kale Latchall. We draw on a night side, Cesar Delgado. Right? So, so, so we're going to hire Cesar there at night side. Well, we look, Cesar's working at five day side. So now we have to move Cesar. To a 24-hour spot, which opens up now a spot at five, and so probably there might be a guy like in battalion four that gets hired before Kale. So there's a lot of movement for one move. So is it is if I were to take something away, the earlier I can do something, the better. Yes. Yes. Because like what they had said before, you can go to bed. She may have gone to bed with five vacancies, partial vacancies, and wake up with 20 people have called out sick. Now you're doing all those moves for 20, 20 pe people. 20 times. Mm -hmm. And also, you know when you do something on telestaff, it spins and it takes a long time? That's how long it takes us. Ours is not any quicker. So it, it is time consuming. Chief, question two? Uh, so we got them stacking up. Ah, good. Uh, our goal is to be done by five. Just uh, okay, so there was a running. question about automation. I think we, uh, you may have touched that before, but is anything automated? Other, you, uh, a human being, makes every touch, right? Correct. There may be some automated recommendations. Even you we, if you get touch? notified for overtime, that's that's still a manual process. Gotcha. You click a button that says "Call Brady Miller. Tell him he's got overtime." On Twenty-four the, hours, preferably on at the station flex two, unit. Preferably <laughs> on the flex unit. <laughs> right. It's no. like when my phone rang earlier, somebody pushed the button in that office to make that happen. Yes. Mm -hmm. huh. uh, okay. This is a, I guess, a general 
question. So uh, is it, so this talks about taking small blocks of leave in the middle of the shift. Mm. And this would be from your perspective, right? So uh, someone has asked, is it a massive hassle, I assume, from the scheduling office? When people take uh, a few hours of leave in the middle of a shift, uh, and some folks need, oh, I was just, they wanted to hear that answer to that, right? Paul, you look like you want to answer well, that. Well, I mean, the, the, word, the word Donald Huffman likes to use is potentially. <laughs> potentially, that, that is a problem. Yeah. You know, nobody likes to hang around till 1 o'clock to work for three hours. You know, when somebody's all right at home, not a lot of people want to come in. So it, it potentially can be a problem. And there's other people that live in the county that like those spots. Um, but yeah. So how do you decide who does what? Like, like when, do, when do I get a phone call that says, hey, I know you're teaching at the academy at noon. Mm -hmm. Can you work for these three hours? Like, what, are you signed up just for this? Are you, are no. You, no. no. you have to be signed up. You have to be signed up. Okay. So I guess I, I want to hop in, right? Uh, so nothing precludes anybody from doing that, right? I mean, that they certainly are allowed to do that, and that's been bargained, so that exists. It, uh, and I know from travels in other fire departments, right, it's – I don't want to say we're somewhat unusual that we can take small blocks, but some places, hey, you got to take the whole day off. You don't just get a couple hours of leave, right? And, so. and you talked to us earlier, Chief, about the facts. I yeah. think with the old – before tell staff, yep. when you had to fill out a leave request, give, give it to your captain to sign, and then send it to scheduling – I think a lot of those parcels used to get shot down by the captain saying, take 10 hours. I got you. But I, with, with tell staff, I mean, you just... Yeah, right. As long as there's in. a leave spot available, yeah, they can have it. The other thing, uh, back to when you were talking about the automated stuff, is that leave gets approved on automation, but you are not notified by it. So it's your responsibility to check to see if your leave gets approved. And yeah, how often um, is that? Three minutes, right? So No, every hour. Oh. So on the hour. So if somebody gets so we get numerous emails or phone calls of people after 1900 they didn't know their leave got approved the next day, and I'll go back and I can check and audit and look at it and know that it got approved like three o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So my advice to people is to check their email, check their 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 leave before 1900. They'll know after 1800. If for some unusual circumstance uh, somebody had leave tomorrow and now they're getting put on AML and we cancel leave at like eight o'clock at night, we're looking at the leave calendar, or we're trying to look at the leave calendar or um, to see who's next up, if it's, if it's even gonna get approved. So I think a lot of people's misconception is that when their leave gets approved that they're gonna get notified and that's not the case. So um, go on, Chief. Let me toss two more out there and then I know that you have some things you wanna get to, so we'll continue on them and see how they continue to roll in, right? Uh, one person asked, is the schedule always built from Battalion 1 to Battalion 5, or are there different parameters used on how the schedule is built out? It doesn't really matter which end of the end we start from. We can start from Battalion 5. We can start from, we start with the doc. Uh, it just seems like the flow of it usually, I, probably 99% of the time, I start at the top and work my way down. It doesn't really change how things are going to work out there or where people get detailed to kind of a follow-up but from a different person uh who gets drawn first command battalions is there a favorite way to process it and is this shift dependent so a lot of pieces of that but i guess like hey what when you start out what's the pecking order right where do you go through in terms of go ahead, yeah yeah so so basically we start with the staff positions so when we so when we're talking if we're talking about the shift before at 10 30 we can start hiring we start with the staff positions, battalion chiefs, dock chiefs, uh, EMS duty officers, safety officers, scheduler. And then um, the way I do it, now everybody does it a little different. I do officers for 24, officers for 10, or you know, day or night side. Then I do medics for 24, and then partials, day and night, and then I get into like the firefighters, being drivers and anything like that. And some of the things that might dictate also, though, is that uh, when I sit there and I have, uh, you know, like 50 vacancies, let's say, I'll pick away at some of the small stuff. So, like, when I, when I mean small stuff, like the boat operators or boat crew, because that helps narrow my field down. Again, if I have a medic that's a boat operator, but he's the only boat operator signed up, then I have to use him as an operator before I'll hire him as a medic. 
So I'll, sometimes I'll pick at the small stuff. I, you know, we like he said the staffing positions, and then as far as out in the field, I'll just start picking at the small stuff away, and then I might have you know whatever the larger amount that might be the, what's left. See, in, in my opinion, the, like I was saying earlier, the officers and the medics are generally the easiest to do. You know, especially on Kelly. So if there's a vacancy in Battalion One and it's a Monday, you got a Monday Kelly, right? No, it's Sunday. Sunday. So let's, greatest thing I ever did. You know, so let's say. Um, I, let's say there's a spot at station 15, and I draw on it, and the first person that comes up is Captain Miller. Uh, and there's a float in his station. The float goes to 15, Captain Miller goes to 2. It's easy. It's done. It's quick. Um, and if, I feel like officers and medics, they both normally fall into their own positions on the Kelly days, so they're very easy uh, Kelly day overtimes to get out of the way. One of the things, though, that uh, also is that um, some of the battalion chiefs have let us know, like, certain, if Cap Miller's off, then this float officer needs to be at this station. So if you have the off-going officer from Station 2 hired for overtime, he thinks he's going to be at Station 2, may not be the case because we need to have this float officer there, so then he gets sent to, like, 19 or somewhere else. So those are some of the exceptions why, you know, we do some of the emails or phone calls or text messages or whatever that we get is that can I get moved back to my station? Well, that could affect the hiring rules. So it's not always, um, we can't always move them back into their station and we can't bump people out of battalion to do the hiring, to hire you back at your station. So I, I have a question, two kinds of um, ends of the spectrum, force holds, one. Uh, worst how part do we, of my job. Is worst part of your job? Yep. So how do you, if you anticipate force holds tomorrow, um, is there a way to, you, how do you deal with that? Like, um, it is, you know, the thing about it is, uh, we, we have tried to make as many phone calls as possible not to get people forced out. Um, you know, bargaining with people, trying to do the best that we can. Like I got this three hour spot. Can you fill it? You know, five hour spot. Um, you know, it gets to a point where, where we can't even, uh, get friends. I had an officer call me. Um, one of his people went home in the middle of the day. He's like, well, you're going to call and get somebody. I'm like, I have five force holds right now. I don't have anybody to replace them. I don't have anybody to replace. He makes a phone call, and he got somebody to come in to, for, to fill his vacancy. So sometimes it really relies on the people out in the field to make phone calls or um, you know, express the importance of taking care of each other and coming into work so that we don't have to force hold. But you won't move anybody. Force holds... We're not going to move them from one station to another. To if, prevent a force hold at two. And it right. I can't move it. somebody that's assigned to two to 16 to now have the force hold at two. Okay. It can't do things like that. So they're really um, where they land. They are where they land. And, uh, you know, we try not to um, because there are people that are detailed from overstaff, right? So they're not in their stations. But I can't if, – if several people call out sick – and Battalion 1, and it looks like there's going to be a bunch of force holds. I can't move some of those detailed from overstaff people that are assigned to Battalion 3. I can't move them to Battalion 1 to, 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 to spread, spread, the spread, holds. Spread, spread the force holds. Um, so that's the unfortunate part. Uh, you know, and it's, uh, you know, it's people calling out sick late. It's people that have been notified about their overtime, and they wait like an hour or so and then call and cancel the overtime, and then we realize we have another vacancy. Um, there's no easy way to do the force holds. And um, a lot of times we'll just call the officer and this is what we need at the station to let us know. But Chief, before we even uh, get to that point, they send out notifications. Yeah. There's emails that go out. There's the um, MSEN Everbridge system that is used. So if people are saying, oh, I didn't know there were force holds, that's maybe that's the time for them to individually look at signing up for the notification yeah. system, which they can do through a TSR on Quick Links. And that's the easiest way to be notified that there's positions available, which they have to send out the page and an email to say, hey, we're looking for a boat operator. So Has it always, have we always identified where we're, the force hold is? Like, when it's I the want to say yesterday hold, it said no. it's at station whatever. Um, that's usually because somebody went home in the middle of the day. Hey, I, I need a body at this position right now at this station. Mm -hmm. um, generally, it's, hey, I'm, um, when it's the... If I need something specific, like she said, like a boat operator um, or something specific, then we have a specific MSEN that we'll send out and we'll say, I need a boat operator tomorrow, day side, or for this time, or whatever. 
Um, if it's like I have 10 vacancies in their bodies, for the most part, I just send it out. Like I can make, I can make it work with something. If I get some bodies, it might have to move some people around. But if I get some bodies, I can make it work. So on the other end, extra people. Everybody decides tomorrow they want to come to work. What 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 do we do then? Well, that. Go ahead. So, uh, okay. so a lot of times that's where you'll see like the move personnel placement, and that's the move PP. A lot of people don't know what that means. It's no, I don't move personnel placement. Okay. Yeah, I've I've heard all kinds of different things, and uh, I, I like to give examples because I think it's easier for people to understand. So let's say it's a Tuesday in March. Okay, Tuesdays and Thursdays we have the most people. It's an awful Kelly day, right? Uh, and then March, nobody's going to leave. Everybody comes to work, so we have a lot of people. So an example of when we have extra people, let's say Battalion 1 on A-shift, there is one firefighter unassigned, and all of Battalion 1 is full, right? We can say the whole roster is full. That's fine. But there's one vacancy, and that's at ECC, right? So in this circumstance, we'll take my, uh, my favorite firefighter from 19A, Ricky Grierson, and we'll move him to uh, ECC as moved people placement, and then we can take that extra firefighter, plug him in. Because we can't have overtime and extra people. There, there, well, there's an exception to that, but generally you can't have overtime and extra people. Is there a pick order where these extra people go? It, it's, we, we, we try to do it in a, you know, like with Ricky Grierson again, let's say the unassigned person is, um, Slow, who's assigned a 19A. If we move Ricky, then Slow can go back to his home station. So that, that move makes sense. And then obviously, if there is a uh, vacancy that pops up later, that all gets undone. Ricky goes back to his station. Slow goes to another station. We hire overtime at ECC. So like if, uh, if we show uh, the roster for next shift on the screen, we have... Um we have uh, next shift, I had to move some people for personnel placement. And if you notice that uh, Josh Allison is from 24A, he had to get moved um, out of 24. And at station 24, we have Floyd Butler that got moved in. So I, had, I didn't have any place to put Firefighter Butler. So therefore, I had to, I had to find, make a place for him. I had medic vacancies, so I moved uh, Firefighter Allison out to go fill a medic vacancy. And I moved Firefighter Butler to station 24. Because there's another medic at 24 that can. So that one simple move that we just did four <laughs> right. things. Now That's something what Paul was talking about. Right. Uh, and and if a vacancy not. opens up at 25, I might be able to move Butler. Firefighter Butler may move back into Station 25, or he may be moved back into Battalion. I might be able to move Firefighter Allison back to 24. So. All right. So okay. but there's another code. There's more. No. Okay. I'm okay. Sorry. So then there's also moved to make room. That's another one. You don't see that one as common, but for an example, that would be. Station 20, the junior firefighter needs to go on engine 720 to training. For whatever reason, he has to be on engine 720. And their roster is full, right? So what we'll do is we'll take the senior firefighter, move him out, and he gets a code moved, make room, and then the junior firefighter takes his spot because he has something he has to do on engine 720 for whatever that might be. So you will see that, you will see that pop up from time to time, you know? And then uh, with the, going with the move codes, you know, uh, we'll have, oh, you got the move scheduling up there. So there's all kinds of move scheduling, there's move medic. Uh, a lot of times when you see like the moved scheduling, move medic, move ECC, a lot of times that is because there's nobody signed up and you have to be moved to fill that position. Okay. So, so we have a ton of questions uh -huh. uh, and I'm going to ask that Chief Davis kind of pick some of the better ones. And I apologize in advance if we didn't get to your question. We will try to. But. Yeah, so uh, we'll just roll with some of these. Uh, let me scroll back up because there's so many. Uh, sorry, I should have been ready. You caught me off guard. Well, let's go back here. So uh, somebody asks, uh, if you get OT RIF, where does that place you in the hiring for other vacancies? Within the union contract rules. That's a good answer. Next question. It, it's, it's, it, 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 it's because it's a, it's a loaded question. It, that, that is a loaded question. If you were hired as the HMO at Station 7 and you got rift, you're not getting hired next at Station 1 as the officer. You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of um, 
variable. Yeah, so, right, right. Uh, I mean, uh, and this just comes from my position, right? Yeah. There are, over time, there are many, not over time, over time, but over the years, right, there are many, many intricacies yeah. of the hiring process for overtime, and that is uh, bargained for, right? That is collective bargaining, and that's what happens there. And we see changes over time, sometimes with the different contracts, but uh, the schedulers are bound to that. They have a little flexibility on things that aren't in there, but, right, so that's important. And I do notice it at HMOs and then 31, it, 20, you know. Yeah, there, there's, there's a lot of variables with that question, yep. and, you know, you know, like, uh, an, an easy way to answer it. Let's say you are the only person on Kelly hired overtime. Like you're it. You were the first person hired, and you're not at your home station, so you know you don't get that right. And you know you're just hired in a spot. If your rift and another position opens up that you can fill, you will probably get that spot, unless it's somebody else's home station. So, so you like that, you go down this rabbit hole, but right. yeah, a lot of variables. It's like being on a cruise ship and you cross the international date line, and it's Good Friday, right? Can you? have meatloaf for dinner or not, right? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, another good question. Do day workers ever get consideration to get detailed in the battalion, or are they always detailed in a day work spot? Whew. They should be in a day work spot because they get off at 5 o'clock, and if they are in a 24-hour spot, then... The, they have to wait for their relief to come in. So they will get moved, if need be, into a day work spot, whether it's in their battalion or not. But kind of at his last resort to go to somewhere in, that's in Correct. a 24-hour spot. Yeah. Trying to prevent that hold. Yes. So we would like to ask one more, and then I think uh, be worthy of uh, Chief Mullendore talking about a little bit about her position as the staffing chief and her responsibility and that stuff. Uh, how does the 48-hour rule work with force holds? We will not go over the 48 hours in order to prevent a force hold. And that's been upheld by the docs in the office as yes. well. So, so that's all there, three docs or so, four are so, saying that. Yes. So we have, you know, there have been people that I will say they've offered to stay over 48, so there isn't a force hold. Right. Um, but there gets into other ramifications with that, um, and the docs have said absolutely not. So. Okay. Uh, we have some others. We'll see how time plays out. Right? Okay. Chief, uh, if you would just to... kind of, and I mean, if we want to get into, I don't know if we have time to get into transfer requests and things mm -hmm. like that, but you, you can go ahead. Okay, so my I oversee the scheduling office and then also everything else that deals with uh, staffing. So some examples would be um, like military. We have I do all the short term like monthly drill military leave and long term deployment. So setting up their telestaff calendars and coordinating with um, admin services to get their time cards adjusted. Um, so I do that uh, FMLA and parental leave. I am the administrator for fire rescue. So that's not only uniform, but all the, also the civilian personnel for fire rescue. Um, I say that there's a caveat. I don't approve FMLA. I am the go-to from fire rescue to the county. Um, so the person has to still apply for FMLA on mm -hmm. their own. I enter and tell a staff and I give additional direction if needed. Um, the transfers, so I do everything with transfers, whether it be I, you know, the transfer meetings, the transfer requests, the, once it's done, figuring out the effective dates, um, putting them into telestaff, that's all done by me initially. And then it's verified by the schedulers per shift. Uh, annual leave selection and Kelly Day picks are on me. I do that in coordination with technology services. So the annual leave picks are gonna be this fall the process really starts in May. We get kind of our schedule worked out, and then we have to get a seniority list, so that's all in the works. So what you guys see coming out this fall is when we start the process. So that's an eight-or-so month process. Yes. Wow. So And we build on last year, so it's not – I don't reinvent the wheel every year. I have a, a guideline, but there are certain dates that have to be done. By August 15th, we have to get – have that seniority list really – 
being worked on, the seniority, the draft seniority list has to be out for X number of days. Then it's uploaded into Telestaff, and then we work on when all the dates have to be in. Um, and temporary assignment tracker, uh, whether that be people off on um, military, different training, ALS training, or you know training at ECC, they're out of their position, so we have to, you know, I track that. Um, some sick leave stuff, the uh, recruit placement. So when people are graduating the academy, work with the academy staff and all the docs, and then get that. That's all, um, what I do. Um, details off the floor. Every time someone puts in a detail off the floor, they, you know, the um, battalion chief will request it or a captain will request it. Whatever it is, they fill out the form, it gets approved, and then I'm the one that enters them in telestaff. Um, you know, anything that's dealing with the the budget or the uh, you know CBA rules that are new, I implement those into telestaff. I don't make the decisions; I just you know, make them work in telestaff. Are we up or down right now? We're down, right? Yeah. How many? A lot. Um, is, is is a lot? Thirty is a lot. Seventy in, people. Seventy, like more than that. Um, really? The fire chief did a, like one of the uh, fire chief videos a few months ago, and we need to hire several, like towards ninety. So, oh, okay. So, but those are. Those may be old numbers, so don't quote me on no, any no, no, other numbers. Need, but but yeah. we're, we are down. But we are, yeah, and we are hiring. Yeah. Um, just the other day, I think uh, Jackie LaRocca had sent something out, like the process for hiring, so you know people know the process for hiring, but yeah, we're hiring, mm -hmm. and we need to. Okay. Um, when, as far as transfers and all that is, you know, done by your office. Mm -hmm. Tell me, can you walk us through that process a little bit? Like, Paul and I both want to go to uh, 16. How, you know, how... We both wanted to go to 2A. I, I got it. You but. did. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Tell, can you kind of walk us through that process, what being in the push mode means? Sure. Things like that? Um, yeah, so actually, Michelle, can you pull up um, on the screen, can we show the uh, station vacancy page? Um, so, yeah, so this, the place, the availabilities will be listed on the station vacancy uh -huh. page. You see that, you have to put in a transfer request. Um, that goes into the transfer management system. Yep, so if you scroll down, you're like, you're looking, you say, hey, I want to go to one of these positions that's been announced here. You put in a, a transfer request. All of the rules for, not all of the rules, a majority of the rules are listed right on this page. So all those bullet points, Michelle, scroll up, um, read those. That's how the transfer meeting goes. Like It'll tell you if you don't have the 21, or, you know, you know a year and a half. There always some question to me is, hey, Captain, I did or did not get why, this. Why? why didn't it? Okay, so if it is a voluntary transfer meeting, meaning all trades and transfers are going to be uh, considered. Those are January, April, July, and October. Quarter. Which, yes, are listed on the page. Okay. Um, then we'll have if push mode. We're in push mode if we have newly promoted people or newly uh, uh, you know, credentialed. So if we have new medics that are credentialed or we have new people signed off at ECC, um, or we have the newly promoted. So that's when we're going to be in push mode. Those happen at all meetings outside of, you know, the January, April, the quarterlies. So um, let's see, for this month, we have master firefighters that have been promoted. So we are going to be in push mode for master firefighters, and that's it. We're not, we're not going to be voluntarily transferring captains or lieutenants because we're not in push mode for those. We only have the newly promoted to place. Um, so a lot of times when you get questions, why didn't I get this spot? It's probably because it's outside of the quarterly meeting or you didn't have your time and someone else did. But we could be in a push mode at a quarterly meeting, correct? Yes, and we will cover that then too. So and in push mode, we're gonna transfer all incumbents first and then place the newly promoted. Okay. And then the rules are just either on that page or... They're on that page, yeah. Okay. 
And, and like the chief said, if you have a question, you can probably answer it by reading that page. Yes. It's probably there. It's a lot of reading. It, well, it's probably there. It, but you really should. <laughs> Did you have two questions, Chief? Uh, here's one related to that. Uh, and probably if I read the page, I would know the answer. But I'm going well, I'm <laughs> to <I'm gonna> read it. <laughs> I can't read it because Michelle put it up and I can't read what was up there. If multiple captains with less than 18 months put in a transfer request for the same vacancy, how's that handled? Okay. If it's during a quarterly meeting, if you have multiple people and none of them have their 18 months, they're going to cancel each other out. If we're in push mode, then the 18 months, it's regardless of that, but it is on there. So, so read the page. Yes. Got it. That's it. I'll, I'll hold off on that. Keep, uh, keep going. All right, so let's talk some CSB stuff, not CBA. So yeah, I got you. Not good. <laughs> My bad the first time. Hmm. Um, can, uh, can walk me through that process, how that works. Hmm. Can fire two, can work for, I mean, is it rank for rank? What it, tell me. Well, one of the things also is it can be found on the scheduling section of the quick links. Where is that? Right under operations section, <laughs> the scheduling section. And, Can you switch and, and it? While, to while Michelle's I looking for that, I, my advice to everybody is find somebody equal to you, and it'll always be approved. That's the, you know, that's well, that's that's the easiest way to say it, you know. But I can work for a firefighter. Yeah, but that firefighter will never be able to work for you. Okay. Unless it's approved because of an injury. An injury, right, right. Or whatever. But like you know, if you know, if you live in a tiller spot on on tell staff, you know, find a tillerman, that and you're guaranteed to get a, your work approved. Make your life easy. Well, it, it makes the person trying to get off life very, very, yeah. Not right. you, the school. It does make our life easy too, but yeah, yeah. So if you go under under Quick Links under Operations Division under Operations Section, you have the Scheduling Section, and when you click on it, <clears throat> so I think I I look at this. No, I don't want to say often, but more than once a year because I think there's some interesting things on where you just were that page you just were on even as far as if i work at company 10 who's supposed to be there you right. know I, I i'd like to know that um and all that information is on so there if so they, if they could go back to slide eight and just leave that up there while she's talking they can see some of the different um options like every one of those headers has a, like a sub menu and some of those menus have other ones so i just put some examples that are showing on your screen now so michelle can talk about the csbs Go ahead, Michelle. So uh, with the CSBs, again, it's all under Quick Links and uh, what the CBA agreed upon um, as far as approving. It does get reevaluated. We try and look at them every day to, uh, to approve them if they're not approved. Again, like what Captain Gross said, was that basically if you get something that's equal to you at your station, then there should, there's not a question. Your work, then your work stuff should be approved. Um, you follow down the criteria and we evaluate outside the 14 days and then we have uh, the evaluations greater to 14 days and then we have um, you know less than less than 15 days and then of course three days prior so if your workshop hasn't been approved and one of these things you might want to look and see how far out it is um, we go so right now so like today as I worked I looked at I will I had honestly didn't get a chance to get to it yet today but um, look at the next three days. So I already looked at Fridays, obviously, when I built the schedule. But I'll look at the next two days in case somebody puts them in, like, last minute for work subs and see if they can be approved. Or if it's something that, for whatever reason, wasn't approved before, whether it's like a, um, we'll use the HMO again. Um, if we have an officer that's an HMO at Station 28 and he's getting a non-HMO, it wouldn't be approved, you know, right away. Um, so... We because of do. the specialty of the HMO. Because of the specialty of the HMO. So as we go through, there's different criteria as you go through the different steps. Um, you know, basically, if it's more than 14 days out, if you meet one for one, you're driving, medic, whatever it is, officer, then it'll be approved right away. Then it gets reevaluated at 14 days. Does it meet those that criteria? And then if so, then we can approve it at that step. If it still doesn't meet any of that criteria, then it waits until – the uh, three days out when we're building the next next roster. So stuff that would have, may not have been approved for this coming Friday, I may have approved today because I was able to. 
within the parameters of the CSB. What about ranks? Like, is, is if I have a captain at Company Two, John Pebble worked for me. Is is, but Chief Davis wants Lieutenant whomever. When I'm not at work at, at Company Two, how does that play into so it? So it goes back to when we talked about the float officers. Also, that if uh, like if Chief Davis wants somebody at Station Two, doesn't mean that he's going to stay at Station Two. The other thing is that if uh, you get if uh, Captain Pebble is a work sub for you, and I have let's say I have like five five float officers in Battalion One, and I have five officer vacancies, those float officers get first precedent in that battalion. And Captain Pebble will be moved outside of Battalion One to Doesn't some other. Doesn't work the same vacancy. with drivers and firefighters. If you look, if you look at CSBs of everybody on that roster, they have the least rights of anybody on that roster. They can but go. You're, you're they can game. go anywhere. There, okay. there is nothing. So there's no them. reasonable expectation that if I work for Daryl out, that I'm going to be a company too. Correct. Now, but now, the nice part about it, we though, try. The schedule is try by all means to, to make that happen, yeah. but it just might not happen. You know. The other thing that people have to understand, so if you, let's say, get, um, you know, if you get an officer from Battalion 4 to work for you in Battalion 1, it doesn't necessarily mean that we can get that officer back to Battalion 4 because uh, for him to come back may affect how the hiring, the hiring rules and how people get hired. So if through the process of done some of the overtime hiring and there is in Battalion 4 there's like some other officer from like 2 or 3 or something, and that guy's uh, and that officer is from you know working in battalion one. I may be able to get him to battalion four and put the overtime person, you know, at station two. Uh, but that's but I after do, the I think hiring. That's a good side. answer. They have the least rights. Yeah, but but yeah. but it doesn't. I know it doesn't always feel this way. But we do try to get everybody to basically where they want to be. Like you know, we try, and it doesn't always work out. But you know, if we like if you're doing a work sub and you normally work at station one. You want to be at Station 1, we'll try to get you back there. Some odd reason. I know. We'll try to get you back. And if we can't get you back to 1, we're going to try to get you to Station 2 or 16, 19. We'll try to get you somewhere near, if possible. But it's one of those things that sometimes of, it's just You not really possible. become fair game. One other thing, though, might benefit you, though, also, if you're like a driver or a medic or something, more so like a driver, is that if you're a Fire 3 driver working for a Fire 2 at Station 2, Where's the work sub going to work? Usually, be assigned when he's at station two. He'll probably be on the ambulance, correct? That it's depends. Like, depend. So, but I don't yeah, follow the normal. What okay. Think would be the so normal rules all the time. Some people, the work subs will end up on the ambulance, right? But you're a driver, and I need you because I have all these other people that are unassigned that I have to place somewhere, mm -hmm. and I have a tiller spot, and you're a tiller driver. You may not be now be at station two. You may be filling a tiller spot somewhere, and I'll put that body at station two. Yeah. So that could be a benefit to some work subs where they're like, all right, I'll, you know, I'm working for somebody. I'm going to be on the ambulance. They may not be. I might need them to be something else. Chief, you have questions? Yeah. Uh, let me see here. So while you sort this through, I, I do have a quick question back to Chief, or back to Chief Mullendore, if you would. So we, when I'm looking at the pending leave calendar, is um, – how come we can only look at that with through the intranet? Like I can't look at it from home. Is there? Is there? It's. I. It's, I, I think it's a crystal report. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. But that would also be a question for I can field that to you. Technology yeah. services. I don't run that. Okay. So I don't know. Sorry. Go ahead, Chief. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So that brings up a uh, different point. So there is a lot of stuff going on in the chat, right? So I think what we'll try to, well, what we always do is give the chat to the presenters, uh, and we'll try to get answers back to some of these as best we can. They may be individual. That's why it's important to put your name in so we know who asked that question, right? Uh, I think you may have answered this, but is there a pecking order when placement in the schedule? Uh, for example, detailed first, then CSBs, then overtime, or... Um, straight straight time yep uh you know and obviously straight time and then uh you know there are so many variables with overtime and csbs there, there are so many variables but you know straight time people obviously go to their home stations or home battalions first i want to go back to the force hold thing uh only because it's become pretty popular this summer right and nobody likes that so the force hold is based upon where it's at right at that station Correct. So, like, if it's today and it's at 2, 
and next shift it's at two. Sorry for station two's luck, basically, as we stand right now. Yeah, I think they said you don't make yeah. movements to yeah, don't make it spread force. Right, right, right. Correct. You don't spread well, the love with force holds. I don't want to say. Yeah. Well, yeah. Right. Well, as I say, you know, like, I mean, if you're at a station and you have like three people take sick leave that night, that's a strong possibility you're going to be a force hold station. Yep. You know, because we're running out of places to move people to. You know what I mean? So, the more people that take sick leave, like, the more potential you have, obviously. Because we run out of people to move over to that station, and then other people get moved back to their home stations. So, so if I'm going to take the really kind of some of the takeaway here is <laughs> do things as early as we can, whether it be sick leave it, or whatever. It, if I know next Thursday that it's, it's, my it's, kid has a doctor's appointment, take it today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't wait till Wednesday night. Yeah. Correct. But yeah. yeah, the the quicker you take it, the higher potential that hole you you made is going to be filled. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's true, though, you know, uh, and then, you know, obviously things get undone, and everything, but the earlier you take it, the better. On a lighter note, somebody wants to know if the schedulers drink Dr. Pepper. Michelle does. <laughs> That's all I got for right now. Keep going. And I don't think extra Dr. Peppers get you overtime. Nope. I don't know if it does. So nope. Let me know. There's a delivery truck out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what are some things that I can do? as an officer, company officer, to help you guys do your job? One of the things- Make is, your job easier. One of the things um, uh, Chief Mulder had mentioned earlier is about, about emails and stuff to us. So we get a lot of text messages, emails to our personal email. Um, and there's a lot of people that, uh, unfortunately there's several people that will go not go through their officer and send us emails about stuff. And one of the things I want to emphasize to people is that uh, some people don't look at the bigger picture outside their station. So when they get moved somewhere, they get they or they're hired somewhere, and they don't understand why they can't go back um, to try and talk to the officer about it and find out why before sending us emails or anything. We shouldn't be getting uh, the only emails we should be getting from firefighters basically is canceling their leave, or they sign up for overtime and they remove their overtime and now they can sign back up. So we have to you know clear out their calendar. Things of that nature is the only things we should really be getting from the firefighters. They should be going through their officers. Um, and the officers also is under, trying to understand um, where we're coming from as, as far as the staff. And, you know, we talked about uh, making sure that they notify us as early as possible in the mornings before people start relieving each other uh, to, so that we can try and get their personnel back to them. Because we, we want the best for everybody. We are trying to do, you know, the best and get people back to their stations or back in battalion or wherever they need to be if they're on a non, if they're on some kind of training status or a non-detail and we moved them out and inadvertently try and get them back but so, somebody coming back to their firehouse is really just a nicety a nicety yeah. right it it's, nicety. there's nothing that addresses it right i'm just doing it because i like so, firefighter x or i want right my guys or gals to work in my firehouse and well we, I, mean, we i mean we should yes. catch that and they should already be there right the other thing, though, like, like, but we're all said, so, yeah, sometimes the error does happen, but, but I, I would hope for the most part you, you don't have to call or email because they should already be coming back. The, uh, the thing is, is that is understanding our busy times. So the busy times are first thing in the morning and at dinner time, like we talked about, are our busiest times. That um, I don't mind, like, the officer saying, asking me a question, why did I move so and so or whatever, and I'll try and explain it to the best of my ability as to why there's sometimes that it might be from a different shift i have to ask that scheduler why something was done but a lot of the um notifications to us need to come from the officer um, as far as moving people back on a rare occasion i'll take it from a master in the morning because they're usually the earlier ones there and they've been designated um, to contact us to get, try and for whatever reason but uh, a lot of the information has come from through the captains if you send us emails, if you call us about canceling your leave, and so uh, Captain Gross calls me and says, hey, cancel my leave for tomorrow. I'm like, okay. I hang out with him. I didn't finish the process. And Captain Miller calls me and says, hey, I need somebody to replace. I may have forgotten about his leave, and he cannot prove to me or prove to somebody that, hey, he called. If you send us an email, cancel my leave next And not next an shift. email to Michelle Root. Well, right. <laughs> about about exactly to the scheduler's email and understand that a lot of people when you send it to the scheduler's email it goes to a lot of people not just to michelle for the day so it goes to all these people here so everybody sees your emails um and you put in there like 
let's say tomorrow you're canceling your leave just day side and I inadvertently canceled all 24, but you have proof in your email when I respond back and I say done as requested, and you go back and look and go, oh my goodness, uh, you canceled too much of my leave. And I go, oh, I did my mistake and I can fix it. If you do a phone call or you send something, send something to my personal email and I went home because of family sick leave or whatever, all of a sudden I'm not in the office, then your email is going to, your email text messages are going to get missed and somebody else, you know, could have done it for you. And now it's after 1900 and you can't cancel your leave. So, um, yeah, so the officers help us out, you know, go through your officers, ask questions. Um, can you, know, you put up slide 15 just so it can be shown while she's talking about it? Because it, it does specifically state what who should call on the scheduling page um, and then the scheduler's email address. Oh, the FRS but, schedule. Yes, and, and there's no need to call a scheduler ever to cancel leave. It, it, like, like, <laughs> like what everybody's saying, it really does protect you because I have definitely um, – canceled the wrong time and you know that that person called and was able to, to any email scheduling and say no 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 you i didn't i've never sent it i've always called yeah you have no proof of that please don't so yeah yeah I, well i'm not now <laughs> glad i watched the show today yeah, <laughs> right. uh-huh. i mean i do i call yeah so yeah yeah some people do call yeah so, but it's a paper trail and so and the, the other thing is like going through your officers you know they can send an email or they can if they if they need to call to explain something we may have responded back to an email about leave or getting moved back or something and they need further explanation they can call us um for the further you know there's some things you can only explain so much in an email but the thing is is i can go through five emails faster than i can go through five phone calls and sometimes if we're really busy in the morning once everybody realizes they're starting to cancel or leave or do whatever in the morning i may not answer your email right away um i may be sitting in front of the computer but i'm building a schedule where i'm trying to get it done and anybody that knows if you constantly get interrupted, how long it takes you to complete a task, mm-hmm. um, that's kind of along those same lines. Uh, and, you know, we, do, we are down the hall from the, the doc and the other and battalion three and the battalion chiefs call us. And sorry, but they outrank you and, you know, we have to get to them first. Certainly. So, yep. I have a question. <clears throat> So uh, I'm on Kelly Friday, so forget it. Forget I'm a battalion chief. I'm on Friday. I'm on Kelly Friday. I forgot to sign up for overtime mm. on Friday, but I remember to do so tomorrow. We will, okay. we will not riff the guy that was hired before you. So here's a couple of things that you the need question. to know. Is that first of all, that if it's your Kelly day and only on your Kelly day, if you sign up for odd hours, meaning like if you sign up from like 1000 to 0700, you can't work the whole 24, email scheduling, like if you, like your Kelly day's Friday, email me before 1030 today, this morning, before I start the hiring, and I can hire you for that, but only on your Kelly day. And just like Captain Gross said, if you forget to sign up and I've done the hiring, I'm not going to riff somebody that's already been hired. So a seat shifter so, that was hired on my Kelly and my spot, he I've, still gets it until another, if okay. another vacancy pops up, then you will be the fourth right. person to get hired. You're not right. not going to get hired if yep. there's a position right. available yes. and you're next up. Right. right. So we still need you to sign up. Yeah, we're not riffing. Riff. We're not riffing. Yeah. Sorry. Right. Sorry. right. Definitely. But still so, sign but up. understand that the process. So, the, we're talking about today for Friday. So now, if you sign up, some now after I've already done the hiring, it, he won't. It won't be reevaluated until that Thursday evening. So, and if you're signed up for odd hours and they get hired, you need to notify that scheduler on that Thursday um, that you're signed up for odd hours for your Kelly day, so to help them out. But uh, we can't look at everybody's calendar to see when people are signed up. One of the other things I wanted to bring up, if it's okay, is um, when you're signing up for overtime, uh, people um, need to understand that uh, if we can show the telestaff screen, the... Um, some people sign up uh, for different reasons. So uh, one person on the 14th decided to sign up day side and then realized that they can work night side. The problem with that is that if there's a 12-hour vacancy from 0700 to 1900, telestaff will recognize this right now as two separate people, you know, person one and person two sign up for day side or night side, will not recognize that person one is signed up for the whole 12 hours. How do we fix that? You can't. You email scheduling to clear your calendar. So you remove both of those sign-ups and then yep, add a 24 hours. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and then also, some people don't realize that they sign up. If you look on the 13th, 
Um, I signed up for 24 hours, but then realized that I can't work the first three hours. You can put remove overtime sign up for any time of the day for whatever hours you cannot work. Um, if you are already hired, then you need to notify scheduling as far as what you, if you have to cancel your overtime. What is the most appropriate way to, to cancel my overtime? I get hired on a random day and I'm getting ready and my wife says, well, we had a lunch date. Email scheduling and say you can't work, work the overtime. And I don't need, um, just like somebody <laughs> asked me how I'm doing for the day without a phone call, sometimes people write a lot of things in their emails. I just need a sentence saying canceling my overtime. I don't need to know that you're going to lunch with your wife. Are you I like to engagement? tell you stuff, though. I know, but you have to understand that those emails go to a lot of people. Yeah. So a lot of people, a lot of people. A lot of people read those emails. So a uh, simple statement of Does that of change overtime. anything for my future overtime when I if do that? If you tell me you're going to your lunch with your wife, no. <laughs> it just makes me mad no. that you didn't take me to lunch instead. No. But if you cancel overtime, it does affect. What are the ramifications of me canceling my overtime? For you or for anybody else? Anybody. Well. It makes other people happy because then now somebody else is going to get hired okay. on overtime. But it might change where the overtime is. We get, might have to jockey people around again, or move them around on the schedule. So, for you. But it doesn't remove my ability to work to the following day or next no. shift. or Not the following day, but if you got hired on the flex unit and you said, no, I'm going to cancel that. Michelle's smart enough just not to. We're going to, you're going to not get hired for that day. For, okay. Yeah, it's not, you can't pick So if choose. I remove any part of the day, I'm out for the whole day. Yeah. You can, well, what you can do, if you're hired for 24, you can cancel like day, like if you cancel day side, you're still still signed up for night side. But like there's If you cancel saying, three hours, then we're going to get you out of there for the whole 10 hours. Right. Yeah. But if Because it's easier for, to, to find a 10 hour spot yeah. than to backfill that three? Okay. Well, that, that, yes, it's the rule. If you, if you cancel a parcel of like a day or night, you're done for that whole course. Yeah. And those rules are on the schedulers page also. All those. You read it. <laughs> I, I might tonight. Okay. The other thing I will to, tonight. The other thing is back to what we were talking about the odd hours for signing up for your Kelly day is that if you sign, if you get hired for 24 and now have to cancel a couple of hours, you would be canceling the whole like day side or night side because you were you were signed up for the whole 24. But if I signed up for odd hours 10 a.m. to 0700, I could potentially get I could potentially hire you from 10 a.m. to 0700 and you're fine. But if you have to cancel any part of that overtime, then you then you cancel then that day that Saturday night side. Yeah. Correct. Well, thank you. Do we any more? We're going to wrap up here before we go real long. I think what we'll do is uh, send the chat to the folks that participated, right, and figure out how we answer some of these back to them. Okay. Probably the easiest thing. So a lot of good stuff out there. So appreciate that, right? Uh, especially the people that took time to write in those uh, questions so yeah so in some fashion or another we'll get to all of the questions do our best to do so yes best to do so um for those that gave us their name and if so meaning that it, does the chat go away when we go offline it does it does but we save the record i mean it, it's it well uh, so why don't we give everybody a couple extra minutes if they have a question they didn't put their name to it put your name to it we'll get yep. you the answer sure and in I mean, every station I go to, I, I'm always asked scheduling questions. Sir, you, you, you can always ask us, too, you know. Yeah. It's complex, right? But there's no way that this is not complex. It's the, complex. People there's so many variables. It. There's so I many variables that it's... Way yeah. complex. But it's nice to see, at least from my point, from Captain Miller's standpoint, that there are so many parts to it. I guess I, I kind of knew, but it, it's nice for you all to... Thank yeah. you for coming here and sharing how that... Works. Chief, lot, thank you very much. Yeah, a lot of people think that scheduling is like just like la la land. Like it's it's not. It's very busy. <laughs> it's an extremely busy position. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. Well, thank you guys again for coming. Thank you for uh, taking time out of your day. We'll get to everybody online uh, to the best of our ability. Uh, I do want to highlight before uh, we sign off. Uh, uh, CCOs, go ahead and uh, sign out. Uh, so Chief Gibbs can, Gibson can do what he does. And then coming up next week, on the 24th, we have a From the Command post, and it has to do with uh, the Georgia Avenue bomb threat. So uh, we look forward to hearing from those participants. And until then, uh, stay safe, please.